Religion to Fascism, Memoirs of a Journalist. What a strong and powerful title. And I have with me today, and the great privilege of having with me today, Muhammad Ali Siddiqui, the author of this amazing book. For those of you who do not know Mr. Siddiqui, he has written more than 3,000 editorials for Dawn, and he's also worked for many international newspapers. It's a great privilege to talk to him, Welcome, Dr. Siddiqui, Thank Mr. Siddiqui, welcome. Thank you, Thank you for Thank you, right, coming to the studios, yeah. TV Apex Studios here in London. Yeah. Uh, you have written a very beautiful book, an amazing book. Thank you. But, do you know, one of the things that I want you to talk about is when you first landed in Kimari Harbour. Yeah. I think that was June 1949. That's right. Tell us what you saw. Absolutely amazing, and uh, I said, "Oh, everybody is a Pakistani. Oh, how great! This man going there in the rickshaw is a Pakistani. That man over there selling fruit is a Pakistani. Oh, I'm one of them." I said, "That was the most defining moment of my life. Since then, I have been a Pakistani, and I have no regret about it. Whatever has happened to Pakistan, or to the people of Pakistan, some of our own mistakes, but..." It was absolutely an amazing feeling. And then Karachi was so modern from the kind of country, city I was coming from, India, Aurangabad, it's a historic city. Mm -hmm. But Karachi was a modern city and modern transport system. And uh, the buses stop where they should stop. And there are tramways and uh, everybody, everything worked like a well-oiled machine. And there was absolute peace. And the city was expanding and there was cooperation everywhere. So. And then the uh, sea breeze, something unusual. Well, this, that was June, it should be hot. I don't recall that, that I really felt the heat, but it was the sea breeze that struck me most. Can, oh, you, something can, absolutely you, can you still smell the sea breeze? <laughs> <laughs> well, I should have. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we went on a camel cart, I mean, the, the, the luggage in hmm. camel cart, and we went by bus. So it was quite normal to travel by bus. No, normal people, good people, travel by bus, something that's impossible so today. So what, what, uh, what did you imagine you'd be seeing when, you know, was it up to your imagination coming to Pakistan or was or something quite different? You see, uh, I was too young, I was a schoolboy, okay. so imagination had its limits and I could dream about Pakistan, but uh, I found it something absolutely exciting a new experience and a new place to live in. Well, this is my country and that's all. That's how I felt about it. And how do you think, uh, I mean, how do you think Karachi in, has changed? Karachi in particular changed over these oh, many yeah. years. I mean, we have heard my sigh. You see, when partition took place, uh, the population was half a million. Then uh, refugees came and population started exploding. Then a million, a million and a half, two million, three million, four million, five million. Till then, Karachi was expanding and Karachi was quite normal. But then, from then onward, especially after the 1971 disaster, and during a youth regime, I liked the man, and I think the chapter on him says, a gentleman's martial law. So there is no doubt that Ayub Khan built Pakistan a great deal. He had his mistakes. He was not a tyrant at all. So uh, industrialization took place in Pakistan. Ayub built Pakistan and Karachi was the center of industry. So people from uh, all over Pakistan started coming to Karachi. That's how expo population explosion started. And side by side, we could see a deterioration in municipal services. But the law and order situation is still there. It wasn't so bad. This is something that I would say began with the 21st century. Uh, Karachi is no more a safe city than it used to be. Crime has gone up. I mean, for information, 
couple of months back, I was robbed. Simply, I just robbed. I and my friends were going in a car. So, from that point of view, Karachi is a great tragedy. And you see, we have failed to develop mass transit. You would not imagine that for 30 years, I campaigned in my newspaper for a mass transit system for Karachi. You know, in 1971, Mr. Bhutto's government laid out plans for a five and a half mile spine, underground spine, from Laluket to Tower, with plans for future expansion. Well, after it was ousted, then the military government wound up the uh, plan. And afterwards, we saw many plans, many plans coming up, approved by World Bank and this agency and Nation Bank, and but nothing really happened. Yes, and nothing I think that really is happened. probably a lot of the story about Pakistan itself. But let's talk about you, Mr. Siddiqui. About when you saw Pakistan, when you were a young man, you entered Pakistan, you yes. arrived in Karachi Harbour. Yes. How did your life progress from that point? You see, in the beginning, it was a question of survival. My father should have a job. I mean, the father, we were all quite kids. We were not in a position to end, to earn. And so we, we were living in a, friend, in a relative's house. Then we moved to PIB colony. Then we left. Then finally, my father got a job. My elder brother got a job. And you wouldn't believe that I too got a job at a very early stage when I was, uh, I just cleared my intermediate examination. So I was both uh, earning and uh, acquiring education. That I kept on doing intermediate, then BA, then journalism, then MA, political science. All along I have been earning. Well, those are years of a struggle. So you're working and? And earning. Yes, yes, I think. And not only me, many people were in Karachi doing this. And society was helping us. I mean, you may criticize them, but because uh, we often came late, because we first went to college, then reported late for officer, so officer looked the other way, because they knew we were doing for some reason, we were earning. Then I also worked, sometimes I had to seek admission in night colleges. And in Times of Karachi, I remember, I used to sleep in the office of the Times of Karachi because at two in the morning there was no transport. Everybody went home. So I slept in the newsroom desk. Everybody gone and I was sleeping there. And next morning, if I had eight and hours, which means 50 peas, enough for the breakfast, then I'd go to Karachi University. So that was it. That and did this, uh, and did, did this struggle, and it was a struggle yes. to be working and and having the resilience to sleep at yeah. the office. And yeah. Did that make make you something different to what you would have been if you had a luxurious upbringing? Oh, I think it does a lot. It gives you, it gives you confidence, it gave me confidence, and you learn to live with it, and that's how you progress. I mean, I, from the benefit of hindsight, I said, it was good for me that I learned to live with, the, with the hardships. So instead of looking to someone to help me, no, I help myself, thank God, and my parents help me. So I think that helped me grow. That's what I can say. So really, I think your message to young people is, you know, don't be afraid of challenges and hard work. Yes. Mm. I, yes. And be truthful. I have come to this conclusion. You see, uh, if you permit me to talk about myself, of I, would I like have it. a pyramid of loyalties. I mean, it begins with my parents, and I am loyal to my neighbors. I'm loyal to my school teachers. And when I join any newspaper, I am loyal to my editor. Then I'm loyal to the Pakistan, state of Pakistan. I'm loyal to Jinnah. And ultimately to someone else above there. So I have this hierarchy of loyalties and that helps me a lot. I have never been a rebel in life. Mm. And I don't believe in rebellion. I think we should try to Evolve. I believe in evolution, not in revolution. So that's and, my message. And, and what do you mean by loyalty? Because loyalty, what does loyalty mean to you? You see, loyalty on the principles, on values which you get from parents, from teachers, and from the great leader like Jina. What for Jina's message? Work hard. For build up Pakistan, tolerate everybody, do not be a fanatic, do not hate other Pakistanis, whatever their religion, whatever their sect, whatever their language, they're Pakistanis, love them. And the message which my teachers gave me, 
enlightenment, education, like that. So really, you, are, uh, you appreciate the people who have been important in your life, and you're, you would like to repair and keep that relationship with yes, them. I think yes. that's really yes. what you're saying. Yes, yes. But, but you're also talking about morality. Yes. And what exactly your question for My question is that you're a very loyal person in yes. your mind and yes. in the way you have conducted your life. Yes. Uh, but you also talk about morality within yes. the loyalty. I yes. think that's, that's, yes. that's part of loyalty. Yes. Mm. Let me ask you, how did you then progress to, to going, uh, becoming a journalist? There is a chapter here which quotes Walter Lippmann the great American journalist, he says, if you take a look at all the decisions you have made in your life, you will realize none of them was your own. Some divine hand uh, imposed it on you. So you see, I had done my VA. I was looking for um, admission to the MA class. I was standing by, then somebody came and, and placed a notice on the notice board. They wanted it. It said, well, the journalism department needs uh, students. I said, how about this? Well, then I appeared for an interview. I was uh, selected. But imagine if I had passed that, if that man had come a minute later, or I had not been there precisely at that moment. So that determined. And from then on, I think, once a journalist, always a journalist, I would be nothing else but a journalist. Once, you say, once a cop, always a cop. <laughs> so once you are a journalist, you cannot be anything else. Yes, but you brought with you morality and loyalty within your journalism. Yes. Did yes. you exercise it throughout? How did you exercise? Because when you, <clears throat> when you write about people, when you write about situations, there's pressures around you. Yes. Political pressures and other pressures. Yes. Did you compromise when you were writing? Did you, or were you entirely true to yourself? You see, Morality and ethics, I mean, people from uh, Plato to person yeah. the philosophers have kept on writing. I wouldn't dwell much on that. But you see, as a journalist, we, had, we have a code of ethics. Now, I must be loyal to the policy which my paper has given me. Either I should follow, I should get out. I cannot damage, I cannot sabotage the policy. Now, somebody may say that this is hypocrisy. If you believe in this and your purpose policy is that, no, no, I don't think this is my, uh, this is journalist's code of ethics. And my editor, who's, who was my editor, for Dr. Mr. Ahmed Ali Khan, for about 28 years, he used to tell us that once you are in the dawn office, when you are writing editorial, writing a story, or editing a story, you must be a dawn man, you must conform to dawn's policy. In your drawing room or on the street, you are welcome to have your views. So, to that extent, I wouldn't use the word compromise, but I had to conform to Don's policies. So, if yeah. there is martial law, if there is censorship, well, you and have to comply Don, with that. You see, an individual or a, a, a newspaper cannot be uh, free in isolation. Freedom belongs to society. A society is free or it is not free. It, I mean, I used to, mm. people taught me, oh, come on, you newspaper, you are doing nothing, martial law is there. Well, what, what is society doing then? Newspapers cannot be free when the entire society is slave, when academia is free, when trade union activity is not there, when politicians are afraid, what can, what can uh, newspapers alone do? So, compromise in the sense that I had to conform to Don's policy or whatever newspaper I was working for. So to that extent, but I don't think compromise is the word. If I compromise, I should get out. No. Understand. I must be loyal to policy of the paper. But yet you you were objective and honest in your yeah. in the way you performed your duties. Yes. Mm -hmm. What about um, uh, what about situations where there was a conflict in your mind, how did you resolve that conflict? Because this is something that a journalist goes through quite a lot. No, I think I have uh, partly answered your question. Yes. Because uh, once I'm there writing a story or an editorial or giving a headline, so I must uh, uh, be a dawn man or must follow the policy yeah. of the newspaper yeah. concern. 
uh, for other newspapers also. This was uh, this should be the policy of every newspaper, every journalist. Yeah. Well, actually, I was reading a report where Noreen Mujahid, Professor Mujahid's yes, daughter, yes. uh, her her speech yes. at your book launch, I think yes, it was, yes. and she said the book is much more than a memoir. Yes. The title indicates Pakistan is the theme of the book, and I feel it is Mr. Siddiqui's perception of Pakistan, as well as about Karachi, which is the interesting, one of the interesting scenarios in your book. So you really talk about not just yourself. Yes. I think you're talking about the country. Yes. After all those years, 1949, how do you feel uh, about the country? Do you feel that it's, it's got a future? And, and are you optimistic? Well, I say I, I'm not pessimistic. Okay. I would say this. But the greatest problem now in Pakistan is extremism. It has destroyed Pakistan, almost. You see, if you differ with someone, well, all right, he's entitled to his views. But we are, you shouldn't kill him. Now, in Pakistan, terrorism is not a theory. Terrorism happening in uh, Chile or in uh, Kazakhstan. Terrorism is a fact of life. Newspapers have been bombed, electronic uh, TV stations have been bombed. 70 generals have been murder, murdered, um, I think over the last five years, 70 generals have been murdered. Besides, they have been bomb blasts in mosques, in uh, imam bargas, in educational institutions, in bazaars, in mosques, during the occasion of Eid, during Tarabi, during Friday prayer, there was one blast in Peshawar, 101 people were killed, mostly women shoppers. Then 124 children massacred in Peshawar. Now, Karachi, Pakistan used to be a paradise for tourists. And uh, European tourists, Sri Lanka tourists who used to come by car, so they will travel from Europe into Turkey, from yes. Turkey into Iran, into Afghanistan, into Pakistan via Khyber, then on the way to Lahore, then in and, to India. And, and it was so well known, the hospitality yes. of the, the frontier people. Yes. It's you know, people were blessed to be yeah. able to meet these yeah. people, yeah. to travel to Kashmir yes. and see the beauty. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was like a magical place. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, the way you paint the picture, it doesn't feel very optimistic, you, see, you know. Uh, uh, I didn't talk about the northern area. Mm -hmm. In Pakistan, Pakistan is the only country where three of the world's mightiest uh, mountain ranges meet. Yes. Himalayas, Hindu Kush and Karakoram. There is no other country in the world. In fact, let me tell you a joke, a real story. <laughs> yeah. Prime Minister Sauravardi went to India, uh, went to America. And uh, somebody said, you see those mountains there? there he said, you call them mountains? In Pakistan, we call them mounds. <laughs> <laughs> so Pakistan is, uh, and uh, Gilgit and Hunza. Now, even they are barren now. There is even domestic tourism is not there. But somehow, a couple, couple years back, mountaineers still came to Pakistan. They were from many countries, from Europe, and someone from Japan. And they are massacred. They are just yeah. massacred. Why? Well, well, they are infidels. So, I mean, I know that uh, that um, that we we all want things to change for Pakistan. Yeah. But. Can you, can you say in your mind what will make the change? What will happen? What needs to happen to make this change? Because we cannot have much more. Yeah. Um, you see, uh, there is no quick fix solution. Okay. Pakistan, you should know this very clearly. And we don't want saviors. We have had four saviors. For God's sake, just get out. May God bless you. Leave us alone. So the kind of democracy we have, let it go, let the system pursue. Now, in 2008, elections were held, and then in next one, in 13, so the yeah. government completed five years. Now, this government has almost three and a half years. So I said, let this process go. I mean, how did India develop? India is still rotten, there's still a lot of corruption. It is quite slow, mm. burgeoning. But everything is working slowly, and nothing has gone, nothing has derailed. 
in Pakistan, it's happened quite often, at least four or five times. One dictator comes, he gives a new system, everybody, some people praise him, then he's overthrown, we go back to the original system. Then this has been going on in Pakistan. I said, for God's sake, then stop. Now, the 1973 constitution has shown a lot of resilience in spite of two dictators. So I said, this constitution should stay, let that be election. That the system go. It is corrupt. We know it is corrupt. But there is no corruption means it is there in society. A of prime minister is not only corrupt. Of course, your, your part of your book, of course, your, your subtitle to the book, is from religion to fascism. Yes. And I uh, uh, the crucial issue is Pakistan. Pakistan from yes. religion <laughs> to fascism. Yes. But you know, I, I recall um, Mussolini's um, quote on that. Of course, yes. he said, which works beautifully for your title. He says. Fascism is a religion. <laughs> the 20th century will be known in history as a century of fascism. Fascism, <laughs> And now here you are, in your book, having both the words religion to fascism. <laughs> now, you need to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Hitler used to call the system Nazism, yeah. and uh, in Russia it was uh, communism, a communist system, and in Franco's own uh, system, so, but as common word, fascism is applied. Uh, so here, this, by system, you mean someone. I mean, ev I think no Pakistani dictator was a fascist in that sense. You see, a dictator is happy so long as you don't want to overthrow him. It doesn't matter what dress you wear, what music you listen to, what dramas you watch, and how women behave, what kind of cinema and TV plays are there. But then, the kind of system which Mussolini had, or which Hitler had, Franco had, and Stalin's system had, uh, that could absolutely accept it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm referring to your interpretation. Yes, so in, in our case, in Pakistan. because religion is a positive value. Every religion in the world, especially Islam, whose very meaning is peace. Now here, in the name of religion, you kill people. You say you must conform to the kind of dress women should conform to the kind of that you have in your mind. Not only women, even men. We shouldn't wear this uh, infidel dress and we shouldn't speak English. You see, and uh, everybody is infidel. The army is infidel, the government is infidel, so everybody should be killed. No, now, all newspapers have received warnings and they have been attacked. Journalists have been killed. We are told that, well, we are supporting infidels. I don't think we are supporting infidels. In fact, so far as my newspaper is concerned, in spite of government's uh, unhappiness, we continue to publish the other viewpoint. I mean, bad, uh, objective journalism demand that if there is government action in a given, military action in a given area, and the government says we have killed so many terrorists, we also publish the other view. Of course, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of Dawn. Dawn you see what happens so. if you are bombing from uh, F-16 and you say 20 terrorists killed, for God's sake, who is going to believe that? Mm. I mean, they're, they're, if it was the population, there, yeah, there men, women and children. So who is responsible? Of course, so we will put that version also. I'm, a, I'm all for destroying um, terrorism. but. The other point of view must be covered, must be given to the people, of because course. we must know that some people are in sympathy yes, with terrorism. It's a balanced, most it's a balanced reporting yes. system. But, you know, I'll go back to your day when you arrived from Kibari, and you probably had Jinnah's vision in your mind yeah. of a secular state, yeah. of uh, when he said, you are free to go to your temples, you are free to go to your mosques. Yes. How true is that? Yes. This must be a great disappointment. Yes. Uh, because not only non-Muslims, but even sects within m Muslims are under threat. They have been killed. So, yes, we have not been faithful to Jinnah at all. We have moved away, mm. miles away from his vision of Pakistan. He was a very honest man, and we have to read him, read his books and his daily life. Then you realize, truly a great man. There is no doubt about that. So, he is my ideal in a sense. But can I ask you a difficult sure, question, sure. which is, I mean, was it, I know it's hindsight, but was it right to have created Pakistan within, you know, within the subcontinent? Was that, was that the right ideal or was it just a dream, but not a real, you know, not a practical thing to have done? 
You see, then you have to go back to history and you have to realize <coughs> that the idea of separatism, Jinnah didn't found, express it alone. If you read the writing of Sir Siyad Ahmad Khan, the founder of uh, Aligarh University, you, f you, see in, you see that in him because he said the British have a democracy. I mean, when the majority wasn't Muslim, so it will be, uh, it will be a Hindu majority, Hindu democracy. I mean, there's no such thing as a Hindu democracy, but the Muslim will be consigned to the per permanent status of minority. But now, you see, especially because uh, let's accept it that they had ruled India for a very long time, so they wouldn't accept the role of a minority. So I think they had to. And then the majority community behaved very foolishly. Yes. They, when uh, in 1937 the Congress minister came to power, they did many things foolish and those opposed to Pakistan. Yes. Uh, so it, there are sides to. I mean, even Alama Iqbal's dream, you know, of uh, Ishtihad, you yeah. know. The law of Sharia in the light of modern thinking. Yes, this is what we should be. We should be craving for that. We yes. should be following yes. those ideas. Yes, and yes. that would take us out of uh, yes. Uh, yes misery. You see, Iqbal's view about Ijma. Now, it isn't a tribal society. Pakistan, yeah. more than eighty million people. Yeah. So everybody can raise his hands. No Swiss democracy. So, Iqbal said in his book. Uh, uh, in his lectures found, found in a book, uh, Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. Yes. So he says that a modern parliament, elected parliament, is the best form of ijma. That's what Pakistanis should do. Indeed. You see, well, Pakistan should not be a theocracy. Jinnah made it absolutely clear. So there was a move during the Allah's days that there should be a council of the theocrats a cleric who will decide what is good for us and what laws should be, they would say no. The kind of thing we have in, in Iran, Iran they have a, a multiple systems of power and the clerics have a veto. I don't think that was Jinnah's no, vision, that was uh, Qaid Adam's uh, Iqbal's vision. Assembly elected by the people of Pakistan is sovereign, it will make laws, full stop. You can go to court, um, you can change it in the court, yes. So, going back to your journey, yes. I think we are going in and no, out. No but, problem, uh, that's but, what the book is about. Uh, yes, and um, uh, you also had the opportunity to work for foreign newspapers and, and you, I think, spent time in both the United Kingdom and in the United States. Please tell us a little bit about your you see, uh, that part of your life. As I have said, I haven't worked for foreign newspapers, I've written for them. Yes. Uh, for Los Angeles Times, yes. Washington Times, and Arab News. Mm. I didn't. I wasn't that staff member. I wrote as a freelance. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes. But you visited those countries. Yes. Uh, I mean, I had my journalism uh, diploma from uh, Cardiff School of Journalism. Okay. And then America, of course, I was Don's correspondent in Washington from 1992 to 95. So there, I had the opportunity to see how Americans work. You see, but the real training that a journalist acquires is in, in his country, in, Pakistan. in his newspaper, every, every journalist. You become a journalist in your country. You cannot become a great journalist when you are working for another no. news. You see. Now, you've, uh, you've um, written a very beautiful book, and obviously, I hope it's not the end of a journey, and that the <laughs> journey will continue. Yes, yes. But if you were to look back at your journey, and look at it honestly and say, well, what would you change? About my ship or about Pakistan? Uh, let's start with yourself, because I don't think you can change Pakistan. <laughs> you, <think? laughs> you see, I think my neglect of uh, economy, I, I rue it, so I really miss it. I mean, I should have specialized, I specialized in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, they recognize this thing that uh, whenever the truly is there on Middle East, I'm asked to write. And I've written tremendously many uh, hundreds of articles, editorials. But I thought I should have specialized on economy, Pakistan's economy. Because you feel passionate about that. Be pardon? You feel passionate about that topic. No, that means uh, I, I specialize in Middle East. Now I should explain Pakistan economy, actually. Mm -hmm you would have made a better contribution. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. But if you had to write about Pakistan economy, yes, 
And if you had to say a few words about that today, yes. what would you say? You see, this is a journalist's speciality. If you want to ask me how an atomic bomb is made, give me 24 hours and then I will write an article. You will think I have done my MA in physics, MSc in physics. So about economy, I can say many things that I know was happening in Pakistan. Well, this government has raised the foreign exchange reserves by $21 billion and uh, exports are going up. There is energy shortage and IMF has granted us a tranche and uh, the rate of inflation has come down. But we continue to uh, depend on foreign assistance and uh, unemployment is still there. This year particularly cotton crop has been a disappointment. Great design. Wheat has been taken care of. I was asking for one one line yes. which would have, which you would have supported, which would have changed the economics of Pakistan. What I, would you say? Is I would say strengthen your agriculture. You see there is a great book, Affluent Society by Gabriel. I did it th three yeah. decades ago. He said few people realize that America's economic strength doesn't lie in industry but in agriculture. Pakistan should do that. You see, we should flood the Middle East with our But they can still do it. Yes. That, that advice is still very valid. Yes, you see. And food industry now, food industry is developing in Pakistan very late. So I think we should strengthen yeah. our agriculture, modernize it and flood the Middle East with Pakistani food So this process. is good advice, even now. Yes. <laughs> so you can, you can take this up going forward. Why not? Big pardon? You can take this topic up going forward. And we will, I, would, I would be looking out for your articles <laughs> <laughs> on economy. But the other question I'd like to ask yes, you, and I'd like you to, uh, this is a fine question I'd like sure. to ask you. When you came in 1949, and today you're sitting, we are talking about this, would you change anything for yourself personally? I think you asked me before the interview began, am I happy? I see I'm happy and uh, no, I think I would be what I am. I feel happy about it. And let me say one thing, in spite of all that, Pakistan has shown resilience and we are a nuclear power. I mean, you make fun of there is a lot of poverty and all that. Well, so is that in India, so was that in China. So, when India made uh, nuclear weapons, the world didn't boycott India. There was no quarantine. In case of Pakistan, there was a quarantine. So Pakistan is made bomb on their own. We can take pride in that. So if you are determined to achieve something, we can very much do it. So I think that's a perfect note to end with optimism so, <laughs> about the future of Pakistan. Yes, inshallah. And, and I congratulate you on your happiness. Oh, so kind. Nice. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you. <laughs>